Yes, and it sort of as a paradigm, it's functioning almost identically to a spiritual perspective. Would you say? I know, of course, that what you will contest is that it's evidence based and it's well. As a yeah, but, but you don't know. We haven't had that conversation yet. Um, but I would say uh, spirituality, I think, means different things to different people. So I don't want to generalize what it might mean, but I can say that if spirituality to you is the sense or the feeling that there's something else going on that you don't otherwise see or experience, that's an interesting state of mind to have. And science is still a moving frontier. Space is still a moving frontier. There's probably more to be discovered than we have yet discovered yes. that awaits us. So I'm not going to say that there isn't something there that you may could be tapping into. Um, I, I prefer hard evidence. Why? Before I, I prefer it. Because <laughs> <laughs> evidence is a good thing. There's so many things you can end up doing with your you can end up doing with your life in the absence of evidence that you could end up dying from it. For example, uh, if someone says, "Here, uh, rub these crystals, and it'll cure your ailments." If your ailment is a particular kind of cancer for which we can actually cure you, you will likely die no matter how hard you rub the crystals together. That, that's an exaggeration, but it's the, it's an, it's the kind of case where, where evidence-based living can have a very important effect on your longevity. <laughs> yes, yes. There's no question yeah. that in medicine and, and these areas of yeah. so, that, that cannot be contested. But I, I feel that rationalism and materialism bump up against certain limits. And, and if, it, if we are to have conversations based on evidence, then in a sense, we can track what materialism, commerce, capitalism lead to. They are currently, like, you know, this is, I don't want to be like apocalyptic or anything new, although I get the sense you can handle it. <laughs> it, it, it seems that it leads to... But your hands are coming out like this, and you do, <laughs> you do look a little bit like Jesus, right? So, so this combination is feeling a little apocalyptic to me, but go on. I'm flinging <laughs> the right. palms out to, to the extremes exactly. of the crucifix, <laughs> even, even as I talk. Uh -huh. well, this is what, what I feel like, that... Human beings have this relationship with the unknown and potentially unknowable, not least through our intimate relationship with experience and consciousness. Uh, well, whilst there's definitely a trackable progress in the, the fields of science and the, the, the benevolent miracles that have been bestowed upon us by the scientific method are you know, this is foundational in what we recognize as society and civilization, it seems to me that there's another aspect to human nature that's dealing with subtler forces that are difficult to know. And, and and, and again, as a man that's dedicated to science, I'm not anticipating that this is the conversation where you go, oh yeah, why don't we just believe in fairies and ghosts and that kind of stuff. But the same way that invisible, uh, invisible constructs and concepts such as the idea of the United Kingdom or the idea of America or the idea of class or to a degree gender and race can be used to control and separate, mm -hmm. uh, I feel that... People need narratives and stories to help them access the kind of uh, uh, perspective that Edgar Mitchell is talking about, a passionate sense that there is something that unifies us. And I would never, with a religious person or a non-religious person, say, hey, I think that you should regard the sublime in this way. But it seems important to me, and I've had a comparable conversation with the, uh, Brian Cox, who I know they are friendly with, uh -huh. like, um, because... You know, you're both, it seems to me, very passionate men who love the cosmos, love the universe. And so much of your book is talking, it comes from a place of love and kindness and Thanks togetherness. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah, that's definitely there. Yeah. And I think that, that you know, mm -hmm. we've got more in common, with those of us that believe that love and compassion should define our experience here on Earth and in the outer reaches of space, have more in common than those of us that are trying to pursue materialistic, individualistic, selfish goals, although I'm capable of being both of those people. I feel that where is the, upon what terrain, mentally do we afford the possibility of negotiation with the unknown when there are still such great mysteries like the formation of consciousness? Every time I see an article saying, you know, new evidence about the configuration of consciousness on neurological pathways, it always leads to, we don't bloody know. the evidence know. that we know nothing about it, that people keep publishing books on consciousness, attempting to explain it. The more, if you just look at the progress of knowledge, when people are actively publishing on a topic, generally it means that it's not 
settled. That's why people keep publishing. The results aren't in. They're, yet. they're not in yet. That's correct. When the results are in and everyone can agree, then people stop publishing on it. So yes. the fact that you can go to a bookstore or a library and see shelf upon shelf of people, people's books saying that they explain consciousness, and those books continue to appear even to this day, it, it's just evidence of that. Uh, whereas if you go to the shelf of the books on gravity. There's like four books. <laughs> That's kind of it. You know, we, we, we get we got to the moon, we got to Mars, we got the gravity thing. All right, we, we got that worked out. But let me get back to your point mm. about the unknown. Yes, the the um, I the unknown is is one of the most powerful forces of inquiry to the scientist. We thrive. In the unknown. We love the unknown. We like standing in the, within the perimeter of the circle that is known and staring out into an abyss and saying, wow, I don't understand what that is. Let me get back to work. So there's a difference between not knowing something because the circle hasn't expanded large enough to encompass it and declaring something is in principle unknowable. And the history of what it is to know stuff does not support the contention that there are things that are unknowable. That, Out go that, the arms again. <laughs> the arms have gone up. The Jesus arms, just <laughs> for those only listening. But even from things that you've, but even from things that I've heard you explain, one of the things that you said that I really loved is that like you say when dealing with people that are, um, I suppose. Um, pedagogical or evangelical is there anything I could say to you that would change your mind and if the person says no then you don't bother yeah, you're kind of done with the conversation right here's something that I'd like mm -hmm. to say though and because like, I'm, I'm well up for learning always I hope it, that, that surely consciousness as we understand it and our experience as human beings limited as it is by our sensory instruments it is contained within certain parameters whilst we can amplify and magnify it in all sorts of directions there is a sort of a basic limitation to our understanding and even from watching your program on the cosmos when you talked about multiverses and even from hearing you talking about neutrinos and how inconceivably l low down the sub particular world goes in this scope the unknowable in terms of the human experience upon that which can be proved that that must be a vast vast territory because we can never know the multiverses would that be fair to say we can never know from a sort of a century perspective I'm the neutrino world that. i'm just not gonna say that because the moving frontier delivers all manner of new surprises to things that you thought were either fully known or partially known or unknowable in a previous time. Uh, take a look, this is a, a medium good example. Uh, in the day when sort of religious philosophies were, night, were deeply embedded, and let's look at Europe for a moment, and someone bends over and writhes on the ground and frothes at the, froths at the mouth. It's really obvious what's going on there. The devil has infused the body of this person clearly so we need an exorcism so the priest comes brings the holy water ex exercises the person and then the symptoms fade away and clearly the devil left the body that was the explanation in the absence of the methods and tools of science and now we know of course that's an, an epileptic fit and it does run its course giving the illusion that removing the devil by holy water and other encant enchantations and incantations by the priest is what actually solved the problem. So back then, that was something that they thought they understood, but in fact did not. Maybe there might still be people today who think that's what's necessary. But the medical profession tells us that this is an ailment that afflicts some human brains. Very unfortunate rapid, uncontrolled firing of synapses. And so that's an example of something that um, may have been unknowable or even divine at a time that we solved and we're onto other problems. There's no question that superstition thrives in ignorance and institutions yes. that crave power will uh, exploit that, exploit that, yes. that, 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 that void. Um, but 
what I'm talking about is that even based on, like on what I've learned from watching your TV shows, that the scope, the sheer scope, that it is put simply the capacity for human understanding must be finite. So the capacity for knowledge infinite. Let me let me agree and disagree with you. Okay. So uh, first, a lot of what you describe, our consciousness, our personal experience, what we feel. In science, I don't even care because the human senses are demonstrably ill-equipped mm. to take measure of the totality of the physical universe. So what science has done, basically since the invention of the microscope and telescope, which happened within 10 years of each other, by the way, back in around the year 1600, then the race was on. I can now enhance your view with a telescope. I can improve your view downward with a microscope. Your senses had no access to those places in the universe until I came up with those instruments. And the run of science over the past 400 years has been all about developing instruments so that you can see beyond the five senses you are biologically endowed with. So when someone comes up to me and says, I think I have a sixth sense, uh, I have ESP, I say, Fine, but in science, we have 12 senses. I can measure things your body doesn't even know is going on in front of you right now. And so, so that, is, that is a power over ignorance that science has brought to us over all of these centuries. Now, let me now agree with you. It's, who is to say that humans, who by our own definition are the first intelligent species there ever was on Earth, Who's to say we have just the right amount of intelligence to figure out the <laughs> entire universe? That's kind of egocentric. Yes. Think about, and I give this example often, I'll do it for you here on your show. You uh, take the closest genetic relative, so the chimpanzee. It's a trifling difference in DNA between us, 2%, somewhere around there. Well, if you're, if you're a human lover, you would say, what a difference that 2% makes. We have podcasts, we have the <laughs> Hubble telescope, we have philosophy, we have art, we have music, and the chimp does not. What can the chimp do? They can stack boxes and reach a banana. Our toddlers can do that. So that's a smart chimp, what our toddlers can do. So we're, 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 sitting, we're sitting pretty happy about ourselves, right? But now, imagine some other life form, 2% beyond us in the same vector that we are 2% beyond the chimps. What would we look like to them? The smartest of us would accomplish what their toddlers can do. I, and I joke that we, they take Stephen Hawking, roll him forward at their, at their human study conferences and say, this human, Stephen Hawking, is slightly smarter than the rest because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head like little Timmy over here who just came home from preschool, alien Timmy. So our most, their simplest thoughts would transcend our most complex thoughts. Yes. To them, the universe might be just a trivial exercise that you learn all about in an afternoon. Yes. Yet we are struggling, requiring the most brilliant among us scattered over centuries with information shared that, and incremented upon one rung of a ladder at a time trying to see over the hill. And we can't yet, whatever that hill is. We don't even know how tall the hill is. How tall the hill is. So I don't know if we're smart enough to figure out the universe, but we're still progressing, and I'm happy with that. Thanks for watching this podcast and going all the way to the end of it. Would you be so kind as to click the bell? It might not be there, but over there, and uh, subscribing so that we can infiltrate your serenity and peace of mind with jangling bells and buzzes. Thank you.